With passion and perseverance, the Craftsman's Dialogue can produce things of extraordinary beauty. Their voices echo through the souls of their creations. This is Makers, chronicling the Craftsman. As one of China's eight major cuisines, Sichuan food is popular both within China itself and across the wider world. In today's age of cultural collision and culinary fusions, this documentary, Sichuan Cuisine, looks at some of the lesser known stories behind it. It is the center of capital markets and a hub of pioneering technology. Busy and fast paced, it is China's youngest immigrant city where efficiency is king. Join us in 24 hours in the city, Shenzhen. If we are to see a future, a vision of hope, we have to do what is right, upholding all that is good and just, passing on belief and faith to the next generation, a legacy that stands the test of time. Let today be the start of all our tomorrows. Welcome to this Razor Special. COP15, the UN Biodiversity Conference, hosted by China, begins later this week in Montreal, Canada. It's been delayed by two years because of COVID-19. The UN Secretary General is adamant about the need for action. He says we are losing our suicidal war against nature. One way of restoring biodiversity is rewilding. Emma Keeling has been to Romania to see how reintroducing bison can affect a whole ecosystem. That's the sound of European bison that once roamed much of the continent until they were driven almost to extinction through hunting and habitat loss. Now they've been reintroduced in the southern Carpathians in Romania. It's a lifetime project because it's not just about releasing the bison into the wild, it's also about uh, basically integrating the bison in the social life of the, of the people around this area, right? You know, in, the, in the local communities. Nestled up on the hill near the village of Aminish in the foothills of the Tarku Mountains sits the campus of Wiwalda. The we of Wiwalda represents the approach to this project, people working together to rewild bison. What came first was uh, the vision of humans in harmony with nature really broadly and of course our bread and butter is conservation and often conservationists don't really really think or do too much about the human aspect because it's out of habit it's not how we were brought up let's say but times have changed Wana Mondok was brought in by the World Wildlife Fund to work on the innovation and community development side of this project we Wilder is a social enterprise founded by WWF uh, employees and some community members. It's set up to be an economic branch of our work here so that we could move this uh, different uh, developments around green economy initiatives, uh, be that ecotourism or different local products or new enterprises which we hope to start with locals. Are you the first of your kind? Yes, we are. I think. Uh, Within the Global WF Network, we work a lot to support conservation enterprises 
but it's always quite uh, hands off. And I think, I'm sure, this, this is the first social enterprise founded by WWF. In collaboration with Rewilding Europe, WWF's reintroduction began in 2014. Transports have been repeated every year as part of the Life Rebison project funded by the European Commission. It's now the largest free roaming population in Romania, with over 120 bison. They were selected from breeding centres and reserves around Europe, taking into account age, gender and genetic background. European bison are different to the American species, which have been called buffalo in the US. The American species is heavier, shorter, with a different bone structure and horns. They graze on grass, while the European species also eats leaves and vegetation. It's the largest and heaviest land mammal in Europe, with males weighing up to a tonne. By returning them to their natural habitat and giving them space, it was hoped these once captive animals would adapt and thrive. And the good news is calves are now being born in the wild. But how the local population would accept them was less certain. The first bison arrived and there were a lot of community members at first release, like close to 200, and there was a party afterwards and then people asked, so what comes next? And it's almost like colleagues back then were thinking, oh, right, what's next? And so at that point uh, I was lured from WWF UK to answer this question coming a couple of days later. <laughs> The crew and I are some of We Wilder's first eco-tourists, staying in the sustainable huts built by volunteers and locals. But more about that later, because right now we're heading out to track bison. Morning, guys. Good morning. Which is which? Matei, Gabby? Matei. Matei. <laughs> nice to meet Good you. To meet you. Nice to meet you, Gabby. Yeah, hi, hi. Welcome to Armenish. Thank you. Okay, so you will be our tracker for the next couple of days. Yes. Uh... Where, where are we going to start? Uh, we'll start just now and we're going to the, to the bison area and uh, it will be like around 45 minutes drive uh, to, to the bison area, the home bison home range. Now you have what, some GPS on the bison, do, do we know where they are? Yeah, some of the bison have GPS colors. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have any fresh data from today, but uh, we know the areas where they, they should be and uh, we'll try to check some of these areas where they like to stay more and uh, we'll try to to spot them. Okay. Well, let's get going. I'll follow let's you. Let's go. Thank you. So we're now starting to go a little deeper into the, the valley, a little more off-road. And uh, we were talking to the one of the trackers last night, and he said, um, you're in good hands with Matei uh, because we call him the bison whisperer. And considering we don't have any GPS, we are totally reliant on Matei's sense of where the bison might be. We're lucky to still have these large ecosystem engineers. The species only survived because of captive bison in zoos. Then in 1954, they were reintroduced into the wild in Poland and other countries followed. Experienced ranger and guide Matej Mikulescu monitors the herds. And biologist Gabriela Retez is one of many gathering data which will hopefully ensure genetically viable populations in the future. We we'll already have a a fresh track here can be a male because usually they uh, roam around by themselves so they don't stay we can also have like groups of two or three males if yeah. they tolerate each other but usually the big males roam around alone we'll try to see if the, the tracks are going further up in the forest bison are what's known as a keystone species they can be a plant animal fungi or even bacteria these species have a disproportionately large impact on their ecosystem relative to their population. Without these species, ecosystems would be dramatically different or cease to exist altogether. We have here, as you can see, a nice trail through thick vegetation here, which is done by the bison. It's one of the roads they have in, uh, in nature. They basically, they create these uh, pathways through thick vegetation where other smaller animals can't cross. Basically, they uh, helping the connectivity to some uh, in some areas for other smaller animals, and they have the same impact in the winter also because they create through in case of a hard winter and a big layer of snow, the bison creates like nice highways through the snow, which are used by all the other animals. 
to cross basically from one side to the other. So how fresh are these tracks? The freshest uh, track we have is, uh, is the mail track, which is probably from yesterday or from during the night. So we are looking for fresh tracks of a herd because it's easier to follow, easier to find. Let's hope we'll uh, find something. Matei has told us we need to be quiet while we're tracking them, which is hard for an unfit media crew struggling up steep tracks. Cameraman Daniel and sound recordist Andre are carrying the biggest burden. It's the boys doing the hard yards. I'm just carrying a little backpack. Coming out of the trees, we discover a sunny spot where the bison rested, which is the perfect place for lunch. All made for us by the Wee Wilder team. We can't linger for long, as Matei says, we're not far behind the bison. So you're a biologist. What exactly are you studying when it comes to bison? What's very interesting here is that uh, we are talking about a reintroduced species. So we still don't know how it is going to adapt. Basically, it will be interactions between the species and the environment, but also interactions between the species and the other species, so intraspecific interactions. So we are monitoring the whole study area. We are talking uh, more than 300 square kilometres. Something very important is to understand also the growth rate of the, of the bison. So basically, how many bison did we introduce? How many new bisons, so newborns, we will have? How many are dying each year? Uh, those dynamics are very important, actually, because uh, we must remember, again, we are in a shared landscape and uh, bringing many, many, many individuals, it will mean that we are also having uh, more interactions between humans and bison, so then also more conflicts. And in order to avoid the conflicts, we should talk about carrying capacity. So what's the supporting capacity of this environment? What's also the tolerance of the people? So you don't want hundreds and hundreds of bison. You need to make sure that the, the bison that are here uh, are OK and also interacting safely with people. Exactly, exactly. I was about to ask Gabriella about collecting bison DNA from their scat or dung when our day was ruined. Oh no, this is not good for bison. This is not good at Very all. <laughs> loud motorbikes. That is not good for bison. Not good for bison and not also for the other species. And, uh... Well... OK, so it's a public space, but, yeah, I mean, <laughs> if the bison were close, is, is, have they gone? Yeah, yeah, they will run. They will run because of the noise. Oh. Well, we were meant to go and look for bison now, but I'm, we need to have a little chat with Matei to see what we're going to do, because they were over there, which is exactly where the motorbikes came from. So, yeah, we've been walking for a few hours, and it could all be ruined. We'll just have to wait and see. While motorbikes are allowed in the area, they should be sticking to the roads. But without patrols, it's hard to manage. Our trek is over, so we head back to the Wee Wilder hub. In 1919, the bison were extinct in the wild, and only 12 were left. Yes, you heard him right. A species that once roamed the European continent was almost wiped out, leaving only 12 individuals in captivity. And uh, from those 12, then we call those founders, we had uh, a group of 55, 54 bisons. And at the end, uh, thanks to those 54 bisons, we have now the, <laughs> the population that we have in Europe, in different parts of Europe. And now we count more than 6,000 bison. They are all coming from that group of 12. So does that cause problems within the bison to be descended from so few? There is inbreeding going on because they are so related if we think that in the case of the humans, if we have like very related humans, then the newborn, the child will, will have problems. And so you've been, you've been gathering this DNA data, haven't you? I think you've got some data in, in July and you're going to hopefully come up with some answers. Yeah, we've been collecting more than uh, around 300 cats in July, but we need to actually collect also other data because the DNA quality from the cats is not that high. We will need tissue sample or blood sample. So far, they haven't seen any mutations in the bison, but geneticists are being brought in to analyse the samples, which will guide decisions around introducing more bison to the area. Every time we reintroduce bison in our wild system, we are actually reintroducing uh, animals that have been in captivity, so they are pretty used to the humans, and those are more likely to generate conflicts. So what kind of conflict? So we define a conflict uh, as the outcome of a, a negative outcome of an interaction. Those, those outcomes could be uh, economically, 
uh, emotionally, for example, economically, we can talk about crop damage and locals are not happy about that. And uh, for example, in Poland, there has been a study, they have estimated in 10 years a loss of more than 200,000 euros. That's a lot. We just hear from the locals. So this is pretty hard to quantify, but we do expect that the animals from captivity are producing those damages because the animals that are in the wild actually will avoid the human. That's our expectation. Here in Amanish, over nine kilometres of electric fencing has been installed and a team proactively intervened to prevent potential conflicts. There are also education sessions to help locals better understand the species. The people in the village are learning that supporting and protecting the bison not only benefits the environment, but also the local economy. The village of Armenish in Romania welcomed the rewilding of bison in the nearby mountains. With many people moving out of the area to look for work, Rewilder's development of ecotourism built around the bison promised a sustainable future. But to succeed, they also need income generating ideas. Elena Floroy is taking us to Mumahut, another place for tourists to stay, named after the grandmother of the family who owned this land. So this is the very first hut you built, but we're a good 15 minute drive from your other place. Yeah, well, we are distributing uh, our uh, goodies uh, and this is Muma Hut, which actually uh, is really nice because it's in the middle of nature and it's specifically for people who, who like to contemplate and uh, find some, uh, some inner peace. This in turn uh, gives a stream of income to the locals, uh, the Hurduzeu family with w which we are working here. We are in a joint venture, let's say. And this is a good recipe to bring benefits from nature to the local community. We Wilder understands that nature must flourish for the economic development to be a success. Wana is hopeful it will provide a fertile climate for smaller business startups. So what are we looking for? We are looking for some really special clay, which has a really rare combination of sand inside. One of our uh, main building team and architects uh, was inspired to try and make some natural tiles for some of our natural building projects. Being here, or having the privilege to be here because of the bison, it's our duty to really think holistically and, you know, what kind of micro society that is based on nature could we help to steer or nudge or revive. Because locals back in the day, they would have a really good relationship with nature. They would live with the seasons. And that's why we've got this sort of wild area still living. Back at the Wewalda hub, Bibi and Dosia Villa are preparing lunch. They are employed by Wewalda, providing meals and gastronomic experiences like this one. We are uh, cooking something very uh, spectacular. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's called Balmash. Uh, Dosia and Bibi are our colleagues, and uh, they specialize in this uh, special show, special treat. Mm -hmm. uh, that is, uh, you know, the shepherd's breakfast. It Ooh. contains uh, all the goods. Some... A lot of cheese, I can say. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. And, uh... Tokana and salata. Salata yeah. and tokana. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Bibi and Dosia belong to one of 30 families in a village of 2,000 people who've been employed because of the Bison Rewilding project. So what has Rewilder brought to your community? Uh, can you say that after what the Rewilder Rewilder community has brought to Armenish? When we came to Rewilder in the area here, we have developed the area. We have come to the number of tourists to tourists. Din cauza zimbrilor, din cauza lui Walder, din cauza uh, începerii proiectului și facerii locurilor de cazare a turiștilor. E o, o binecuvântare, o, un prospect început care ridică zona, care scoate zona în evidență. Devine mult mai cunoscut armenișul decât o fost datorită oamenilor care vin să viziteze și... Bineînțeles, al lui Walder, că ei au venit cu îmbunătățiri ca să poată să 
fie cât mai cunoscut și mai... So it's good for the community for having We Wilder and the Bison here. Deci, în concluzie, e bine că We Wilder și VVF și Rewilding Europe sunt aici? Da. 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 Yes. Da. Yes. <laughs> da. Yeah. The Rewilder team see themselves as an intermediary between locals and tourists, and the pricing model includes a conservation levy that will fund ongoing work in the area. It's certainly been an immersive and enjoyable experience for myself and the crew, and our stomachs have never been empty. But our trip won't be complete until we've seen the bison. We have one more day in the mountains, so we can only hope the GPS is working well and that the motorbike riders are having a day off. We are going into a different area today. We have our bison whisperer back with us, Matei. So yeah, fingers crossed, today is the day. Okay, we'll start uh, walking from here. Yeah. We'll try to reach uh, on top mm -hmm. of the ridge and uh, we'll uh, again look for fresh tracks. Okay, Any, we'll anything on the GPS today? Yeah, we have a GPS position from the morning uh, around here a bit further okay. up, close to the ridge. Brilliant. We'll try to get there and uh, let's... Hopefully let's they're the still bison. there yeah. and they're moving slowly this morning. Yeah. <laughs> We already have some uh, fresh tracks here, probably okay. from during the night, because yeah. the, the bison, they roam around. Mm -hmm. The herd should be a bit further up towards the ridge, okay. but we can have a male or maybe some females just roaming around the herd, so they can be anywhere. So it will be important for us to walk silently as much as possible, okay. and we'll pay attention at the noises left and right of the trail, okay? Right. Okay, let's go. So, Matei, you're a local. Have you always known how to track? Because bison only arrived in 2014. Yes, well, actually, regarding the bison, I got more experience in time, mm -hmm. but uh, I always like to track mm -hmm. because I think if you if you know tracks and signs can really help you to understand what's happening in an area in nature. Yeah. And you know this area. And of course, I know this area. Yeah. And uh, but during this time, I also participated to some uh, really nice. Uh, uh, cyber tracker uh, evaluations. Okay. Uh, cyber tracker tra tracking was it's, it's an organization which actually started in South Africa, okay. which uh, which are really good trackers, yeah. and then uh, expanded to Europe also. Oh. So by participating to these uh, evaluations, I managed to meet uh, really good trackers and uh, exchange uh, experience, and uh, really helps you to to know more about tracking. Okay. It was a magical moment, hearing the bison communicate. It was only later we found out just how rare it is. So rare, the scientists asked for our audio recording. So we have this male, adult male, which is looking at us. Yeah. 
he's confident. Usually the males are confident. Yeah. They don't get scared as easy as the, as the females. This is the happy walk of someone who has seen bison in the wild, thanks to our bison whisperer, Matei, legend, <laughs> as he quietly walks away. How big do you think that herd was today? I spotted at least uh, six or seven females, mm -hmm. one adult male, and uh, I think there are at least two or three calves from this year. Yeah. Isn't it unusual to have a male and with a with the, with the with the women <laughs> with the females. Well, uh, you, in the most of the of the year, the males are staying alone, mm -hmm. or they form groups of two or three males. But now, uh, it's still mating season. Mm. It should be over, but uh, because we brought females from captivity, they are not adjusted properly to the mating season yet. Okay. So they can mate even uh, later in the mating season. I so think it's the case now because that's why we still have the male with uh, we did this herd. So it takes a few years for them to adjust, does it? Yes, they need uh, a couple of years, usually two, three years. Mm -hmm. So uh, they need uh, to experience a couple of winters to be able to adjust to the mating season, basically. Yeah. Okay, okay. Because we were making actually quite a lot of noise in the in the leaves, weren't we? I was surprised that they didn't bolt. Yeah, we were a bit lucky actually because of the of the wind. It was quite windy up there on the ridge. And it was a lot of noise around them, right, already because of the wind. Lots of branches uh, moving, uh, lots of leaves falling down. Mm -hmm. So we could approach and we could stay quite close, actually. I think we were like 20, 30 meters away from the bison without them uh, being able to, to hear us, which was quite, it was quite amazing. Yeah. I found it really special when we were walking up the track and, and we suddenly we could hear them and it wasn't just the cracking of branches, that was almost like a, a low sort of purring. It was the mother and the calf which were communicating uh, between them. So it was a, a high pitch uh, uh, sound which was, which was from the calf mm -hmm. and then uh, we heard the, uh, a lower sound which was the, the, the female. Mm -hmm. And they were communicating because it's a very dense forest, lots of bushes there and probably the mother couldn't see the calf and the calf couldn't see the mother and they were like just trying to get uh, one to the other one and uh, communicating between them, yeah. Oh, it was quite nice. I mean, I found it unbelievably special today. Do you still get that same feeling? I mean, you, you do this all the time. Yes, but yeah, even for me, it's, it, it's quite a nice experience because uh, of course, it's, I, like, I like this process of uh, quite a lot of like seeing the fresh tracks, the fresh signs, then to be able to hear them and eventually to see them. It's like the perfect way to see wildlife, right? At the beginning, we heard them just a bit, then we were uh, hearing them uh, more loud, and then eventually we m managed to see them. So it was a really, a really nice experience, yeah. So you were smiling as much as I was then? Yeah. <laughs> the wild populations of bison are increasing around Europe. However, the species is still in danger, listed as near threatened on the red list of the International Union for Conservation of Nature. Thank you. Incredible experience, and thank you for looking after the, the crew as thank well. Thank you very much, Jason. Is it really noticeable, the, the impact that they're having on the environment? Yes, well, we see like lots of small things, lots of interactions the bison have, for example, with, with other animals. We see like the, the birds which are collecting the fur uh, of the bison in the, in the spring, uh, because uh, basically the bison lose the winter coat. and. Uh, we see the birds collecting the fur and putting it in the nest because, of course, it's a much better insulator than, uh, than uh, the, the wood or the materials they can uh, find around. So good for keeping the diversity in the meadows where they roam around because they can disperse the seeds of the plants uh, so well. Of course, also the other herbivores, they do the same thing, but just the bison are doing it as, at a much larger scale. Imagine, imagine a herd of 30 bison just passing through a meadow how many seeds they can carry through the, through the fur and they just disperse them uh, to all, all the meadows around, which is really good for maintaining the very rich diversity that we still have in the meadows around. 
So it's all worth it? Yes, of course. I think, yeah, uh, the place of the bison is in the wild and they can do so much good for the nature. So, of course, it's, it's worth it, yeah. I owe you a drink. Let's head back. <laughs> we often say that we're saving the bison, but I think uh, that the bison are really saving us. Wana is right. Remember, there were only 12 European bison left, and now there are almost 7,000 around the continent. So this is a story of hope turned to action. And yet success is far from certain, with continuing habitat loss, a narrow genetic base, and the lack of European-wide strategy still the biggest obstacles. When we save an ecosystem, we're not just talking about saving animals that few of us will see, we're also talking about saving ourselves, because we rely on thriving ecosystems just as much as they do. Chasing their dreams against the odds, they are rising to the challenge. Banding together for a great cause, they are striving to make a difference. Dedicating themselves to a noble endeavor, they are writing their own chapter in the history of human attainment. Through visits to villages and households, they are resolving various issues faced by the public. They are determined to improve the mechanism for creating a wider and better public safety net. For 10 years, party governance has been conducted with unprecedented rigor, strength, breadth, and depth. As the sun rises on a May morning, the valley is exposed to the summer heat of the day. member inspection team is setting out. Today, I'm going to go to the Liang Shan Shan Kai Lan Xun Ta Xiao Shen. I'm going to go to the Xin Huang Jian Li Ban Li. 
护厂呢负责大数据的比对，好，围鱼呢就负责春季财务管理这一块。Backpack inspection is a unique approach to enforcing full and rigorous party self-governance. Special teams head out to local communities, where they address issues and challenges at the grassroots level. This innovative means of promoting good governance was introduced by Anhui Province in 2019. The 还是有点走势的那种。The four inspectors are being put up by Peng Chuan Li. The regulations stipulate that the team must stay, live, and eat in a local villager's home throughout an inspection visit. In return, they pay the villager 180 yuan per person per day. There are also certain requirements regarding who they actually stay with. We normally understand that 我们一般的现在这样的。This afternoon, the inspection team has invited some villagers to an informal meeting. People sit on benches under the tree, chatting. Gradually, the conversation becomes more serious. However, the team notice that the villagers suddenly fall silent when key issues and matters are mentioned. The inspection team realized they needed to dispel the villagers' misgivings. They launched a publicity drive, putting up posters and distributing contact cards. 你看,这是我们对明确发片 After a few days, the inspection team was familiar with the situation in the village. It had also identified several practical issues. 
，但是有公司来长期管理不到位，就是这样里头脏的很呐，甚至不能水冲。我们发现这个问题，来我第一时间就先把这个公司搞好。The villagers see problems being solved. They realize the inspection team's presence isn't just for show. The forest to the west of the village used to belong to Chang Chi Mi and several other villagers. Each individual plot has been marked out. But the boundary posts were removed in 2015 when the wind power station project was launched. Chang Chi Mi and his neighbor Yi Nai Yo were very unhappy, especially as village committee head Chang Lian had failed to compensate them for the land they had lost. The inspection team subsequently convene a meeting in the disputed area. Representatives of the Forestry Station and Land Management Office, along with the villagers concerned, are invited to measure out the disputed boundaries. The <laughs> After talking patiently to the two families, they negotiate a settlement. The inspection team then reassesses the level of compensation for the loss of land and works out how much money each household is due. However, the inspector's relief at the dispute being resolved after so many years is short-lived. The two families seem to have sudden doubts about the compensation. I'm 政府啊,給我們支持。所以我害怕拿這個錢。Resolute and effective action had solved the problem and convinced the villagers that they were there to help. Shintazu 
是我深深认识到，呃，自己因为工作不主动，导致群众的利益没有得到保障，呃，使我内心感到非常惭愧。Another day is beginning. The sunshine lights up the beautiful valley. The inspection team is still hard at work, visiting more villages and more families. Ten-to-one-to-one-to-one-to-one-to-one-to-one-to-one-to-one-to-one-to-one-to-one-to-one-to-one-to-one-to-one-to-one-to-one-to-one-to-one-to-one-to-one-to-one-to-one-to-one-
were it not for the hard work of its sanitation workers. Most of them are elderly and have their personal difficulties to deal with. So, when they weren't paid in full for almost six months, they decided to approach the village officials. Things were going nowhere. They felt helpless. But then they heard about the clean wind being conducted by the discipline inspection team. The elderly sanitation workers decided that one of them should go and report the issue. The Discipline Inspection and Supervisory Office of Borzo City has established a liaison office for every four or five townships. These offices are a new innovation. They have quickly proved effective in responding to problems such as a lack of manpower and nepotism. <laughs> The liaison office decided the problem was serious. An investigation team was immediately dispatched. During several visits to Changfu village, they went from door to door asking for information. Faced with these setbacks, the investigation team adopted a dual strategy. They started with the accounts in the town's finance office. They retrieved the bank statements and found that the times of the withdrawals coincided with what the sanitation workers had reported. At this point, another line of inquiry began to yield evidence. A sanitation worker found a cigarette packet with his paycheck details written on it and handed it over to the investigation team. Other sanitation workers, now convinced that the team was really helping them, started to cooperate with the investigation. Confronted with conclusive evidence, the village accountant confessed. He admitted to cheating the sanitation workers out of their wages and agreed to pay back what they were owed. He was subsequently given a severe warning by the party and dismissed from his post. The liaison offices have strengthened discipline inspection, made supervision more effective, and improved the political environment at the grassroots. These developments have helped to cement the bonds between the party and the people. They have consolidated the philosophy of engaging the populace and made rigorous party self-governance more relevant to them. In June 2008, the National Discipline Inspection and Supervision Office launched the 12388 hotline. The initiative has expanded. 
so that today call centres handling complaints relating to discipline, inspection and supervision are in place at the central, provincial, municipal and county levels. Establishing call centres for complaints was a key decision made by the 19th CPC National Congress. They play a key role in the battle against corruption. They are also important in improving supervision by the party and state. A comprehensive system for handling personal visits, letters, online comments and calls is in place for citizens and organisations to report their concerns to all levels of institutions and units. The people have become the eyes and ears of the oversight bodies. A highly complex brain operation is underway. Huang Yujia, the surgeon, is completely immersed in what he is doing. He is unaware that several people are waiting for him outside to lodge a misconduct complaint against him. Between 2011 and 2017, Gulo Hospital acquired EV3 high-value medical supplies worth 380 million yuan. Huang Yujia personally applied for 310 million yuan's worth. In return, the trader and Mr. Du purchased a financial insurance package in Harbin worth more than 40 million yuan on Huang's behalf. The issues exposed in Huang Yujia's case including the excessively high price of medical supplies and poor oversight, have been a long-term blight on the health sector. Having dealt with Huang's case, Nanjing's supervisory organs followed up by initiating a coordinated rectification drive involving the Medical Insurance Bureau, Health Commission and Human Resources and Social Security Bureau. New regulations were introduced covering price negotiations and procurement transparency. And as a result, there was a significant fall in the price of medical supplies. Nanjing subsequently launched the Medical Supplies Sunshine Supervision Platform for further strengthening the supervision of hospitals and doctors. This平台聚焦减负和繁复两个目标 那么这个支架在哪个医院、哪个医生、几十几分用在哪个病人身上，这是使用环节。最后这个支架什么时候被医院啊和我们的耗材商和我们的医保基金所支付，这是支付环节。这样整个一个流程在平台上都是完整的体
能够时时刻刻提醒医院，啊，你这个医院里的医生耗材使用是什么情况，对于医生和医院呢有一个提醒和警示的作用。我经常说的信任不能代替监督。过去呢，我们这个临床医生在使用这个呃医用耗材，往往显得跟自己的使用习惯啦、啊兴趣爱好啦，可能会有结合。那么现在呢，是我们的医生们，包括我，像我这样的临床医生，在使用的时候也牢记啊，我们啊要用品质好的，但是价格便宜的。The Xianshu Provincial Supervisory Organs, in handling the investigation into Huang Yujie, acted according to the principle of closing the case, summarizing the rules. And rooting out the threat. Thanks to the tightened control generated by the supervision platform, working conscientiously has become a commitment shared by all medical professionals and administrators throughout the healthcare sector. Follow-up work has ensured that the price of medical supplies has been significantly reduced. Treatment has become much more affordable, with the result that people are keenly feeling that rigorous party self-governance is relevant and significant for them. Practice has shown that rigorous self-governance is essential if the party is to maintain its vitality and withstand trials. Effectively addressing its own internal issues, improving its work style, and maintaining close contact with the people, these are elements of self-governance. Only by applying them rigorously can the party become a strong and dependable core leadership body in promoting the cause of socialism with Chinese characteristics. Abandoned and silent. If these stones could speak, what stories could they tell? After 60 years, this garden, once the lively wellspring of Sino-French cultural exchange in Beijing, receives a special visitor. Over 30 years. From time to time, I hear people talk about my grandfather. He was one of the first Chinese students to be educated in France. He founded a Chinese university at Lyon and brought hundreds of Chinese students to France. Some of those students would later change the destiny of their motherland. I didn't spend much time with my grandfather, and my memories of him are hazy. Today, I am going to seek traces of him in a small town, 100 kilometers to the south of Paris. The town of Montargis in France's Centre Val de Loire has 30,000 residents. of the town's agricultural school looks the same as it did 100 years ago. My grandfather was the first Chinese student at the school. Bonjour. Oh, ça va bien. Comment allez-vous? Ça va très bien. Ça va très bien. Oui. 
donc qui est arrivé euh, en 1904, hein, vous mm -hmm. vous rappelez, le 20 octobre. Oui. Euh, et d'ailleurs, sur le journal de l'élève, hein, qui était donc le journal qui était tenu par les élèves, oui. il disait bien « Le bon enseignement, la discipline, les succès de l'école lui attirent des étrangers. Mm -hmm. Notons aujourd'hui la rentrée de deux nouveaux camarades, dont Li Yuying de Pékin. » Les 14 élèves sortants ont obtenu le diplôme des écoles pratiques d'agriculture. Mmh. Et donc, on voit que ce sont par ordre de mérite. Et on voit que Li Yuying était cinquième.